not the best idea to play some music by a Spanish surf band on episode 385 of Monster Kid Radio, the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. Not because I don't like the music. I really do. The band is called Los Deformes, and they're based out of Rafael, Spain. The name of the album, though. Now, I don't speak Spanish. I barely read Spanish, and I'm still not 100% in the whole nose region. But I'm going to try to pronounce the name of the album. It's Unas Vacaciones Estereo Galacticas. Translated in English, that's a stereo holiday. Galactic. It's from the band Los Deformes. And you can find them over at losdeformes.bandcamp.com. That's L-O-S-D-E-F-O-R-M-E-S.bandcamp.com. Or follow the link in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. My name is Sierra Kim Cook. I want to welcome you to the show and to... What should have been the final week of Edgar August Poll Month, but now is the first week of Septempo here on Monster Kid Radio, where we're going to play the recording of a conversation I had months ago with Jonathan Inbody about an Edgar Allan Poe film, Murder in the Rue Morgue, starring my man, Bela Lugosi. I'm excited for this. It was a really fun conversation, and I really enjoyed talking about this movie with Jonathan. Now, that's not the only thing that's happening in this episode of Monster Kid Radio. I mean, it, it's a big part of it. It's the main part of the show. And it is something that I recorded, like I said, months ago and should have gone out last week, but I'm still recovering from my surgery. For those of you who are just now joining us, last month I had a surgery to correct a deviated septum and a collapsing nasal valve, and it's been a recovery. I'm still recovering, and I actually spoke to the doctor yesterday, and it could be months before all the swelling goes down and things aren't sensitive to the touch. Things are still kind of sensitive. So if I don't sound like my normal boisterous self, that's why opening up my mouth wide to speak kind of hurts a little bit, but that's not going to stop me. I can't make any more excuses. It's time to release Monster Kid Radio as normal. So we've got the conversation with Jonathan and Buddy from the X Meets Y podcast, but we've got some special announcements too. Why don't we go ahead and roll into that right after this? The flesh of the dead and destroys the living. The, the naked, naked witch. witch. Mercy! The most chilling, most terrifying motion picture you have ever seen. The shocker of all shockers in blood curdling color. The, the naked, naked witch. witch. A terrifying story of satanic power and demonic evil. Filmed deep in a crocodile infested Louisiana swamp exactly where it happened. It's the strangest story ever told. Rated R. Come early, beat the crowds, it's breaking records everywhere! Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Jason Giaconetti. You may recognize my voice from the Vault of Starling Monster Horror Tales of Terror. And if you don't, you should be listening. But today I need to ask you a few questions. Do you like big bugs and you cannot lie? Other robots just can't deny that when the Queen of Space walks in and puts a blast in your face that your gears get sprung? Are you deep in the bee we're sharing? Are you hooked and you can't stop staring? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then have I got a podcast for you. Bots, Bugs, and Babes, the B-Movie Podcast. From classics to cults and all the yummy, yummy cheese in between. Look for my new show, Bots, Bugs, and Babes, on the Two True Freaks Network and on iTunes. That's Bots, Bugs, and Babes, the B-Movie Podcast. Double J on the Triple B is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. It's so scary, we dare you to see The Monsters Crash the Pajama Party, the first movie ever filmed in Horror Vision, Hollywood's latest miracle. You'll scream as fiendish movie monsters actually become alive, then crash right out of the screen, go into the audience, and carry screaming girls from their seats right back into the picture to become part of the movie. We warn you, Horror Vision is not 3D. The movie monsters become real flesh and blood. Be sure to see The Monsters Crash the Pajama Party in Horror Vision and color. 
Hey, gang, if you're hungry for a light, tasty meal that's fun to eat, then now's the time to join us at the refreshment center. Our menu's just chock full of all of your favorites. For a hearty treat, for example, have a hot dog, deliciously simmered to a tender turn and then sealed into a warm, fresh bun. And we've got all the trimmings, too. But don't forget to team up your hot dog with a jumbo-sized cup of ice-cold Coke, America's favorite soft drink. For the taste of your life, enjoy Coca-Cola here and now. It's the real thing, Coke. <laughs> And folks, remember, always drive defensively, whether it's here in the drive-in theater area or on your way home tonight. And watch out for the other guy. When you're ready to leave this evening after the show, we ask that you return your speaker to its holder before starting your car. And take a moment to turn your volume control down, if you will. Then buckle your seat belts, pull forward over the ramp, and follow the traffic out. Thanks for your cooperation. Back to the music now of Pat Williams and his orchestra with the theme from Police Story. There's a lot of things going on in the world of Monster Kid Radio and in my own personal world, and I wanted to share that with you guys and gals. Let's start by talking about the new Kickstarter campaign that as of this recording, there's like a week and a half left. They only ran it for a short period of time, but they've already hit their goal, and I'm talking about the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival and Cthulhu Con, folks. This year's theme is Innsmouth and Cthulhu Tiki, and those of you who know me know that I love my tiki culture, arts, whatever it is. I just love that aesthetic. I'm really excited. Now, I did submit a panel. We'll see what happens. I know that some of your favorite guests of Monster Kid Radio that have been on the show in the past, like Chris McMillan and Dominique Lamsey, so they've submitted panels as well, but nothing's been decided yet. However, what has been decided are some of the special guests, and oh boy, Richard Stanley is going to be a guest at this year's H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. He's the director behind the movie Hardware. He also was originally going to be the man or the director behind the Island of Dr. Moreau film featuring Marlon Brando, but that whole thing kind of fell apart and that's a whole different story. Anyway, he's going to be a special guest this year. Another person that I'm really excited about seeing. And you thought I had it tough trying to pronounce Spanish at the beginning of the episode. Now I'm going to try to pronounce some Japanese. Chiaki J. Konica? I may have gotten that wrong. He's an author, a screenwriter. He is from Japan. He's a native of Tokyo, and he is considered the pioneer of contemporary Japanese horror cinema. And as much as he's into the Lovecraft thing, something else that I'm really excited about is that he was really involved in some Ultraman series in the 90s. Ultraman Tiga in particular, as well as a Ultraman, is it Gaia? Gia? I, I don't know. I haven't watched it yet. I'm working on Tika right now. But I'm really excited that he's going to be there. In fact, the panel that I pitched had to do with Kaiju and Tokusatsu and how it has a connection to Lovecraft or it can have a connection to Lovecraft. Fingers and tentacles crossed that they accept that panel because I'd love to talk about that. But either way, I'm just really excited to meet him. It'll be the first time I've met anybody involved in any of the Ultraman stuff, and I love my Ultraman, so I'm really excited about that as well. Because this is Tiki-themed, they're going to be doing some events and some artwork and some of the rewards of the Kickstarter. They're all Cthulhu Tiki-themed, and you know, it's really going to be neat. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes to the Kickstarter for this. Like I said, there's 11 days left to contribute. If you don't already have an account set up over at Kickstarter, well, this might be an excuse for you to set one up. Even if you don't contribute to the Lovecraft Film Festival's Kickstarters, you're probably still going to want to have a Kickstarter account because I've got something cooking Monster Kid Radio flavored that I hope to launch within the next couple of weeks. Also coming up this weekend, September 7th, 8th, and 9th is the Rose City Comic Con here in Portland, Oregon. It's usually not a lot of monster-specific material or events or things like that happening at Rose City Comic Con, at least anything in terms of what Monster Kid Radio is into. That doesn't stop me from going, though, and looking for monster stuff. I've met previous guests of Monster Kid Radio on the show. Tad Kalush has been on the show a couple of times, and I met him at the Rose City Comic Con. Awesome artist, by the way, and Tad, if you're listening, you're the man. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be going on September 8th, so that'll be on Saturday. If you're in the area, I would love to meet you. I'll be wearing a Monster Kid Radio t-shirt of some sort, and I'll be there with Tom Doffel, who's been on the show. Great friend of the show as well. I know that on Saturday, the Lovecraft Film Festival people will be doing a presentation in one of the panel rooms showing some of the short films that they probably will be showing either at this year's festival or in previous years, and I'm just excited to 
hang out with Gwen and Brian Callahan, the people behind the Lovecraft Film Festival, because they're great guys. So I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun as well. Again, if you're in the area, please look me up. Now, if you're not here in the Portland, Oregon area, but you happen to be near a little town called Elkhart, Indiana, you might head over to the Hall of Heroes Comic Con over at hohcomiccon.org and check that out. Why would you want to do this? Well, because Fenghuli's going to be there. On Sunday, he's going to be a guest. And Scott and Tracy Morris, been on the show quite a bit, they're going to be attending the convention for both Saturday and Sunday, so you might bump into them as well. But head over there and tell us Fenghuli that Monster Kid Radio said hi, won't you? The last announcement that I have has to do with a magazine coming out. We're going to go back into the Lovecraft side of things. The magazine is called Strange Eons, and I am writing for them now. At last year's Lovecraft Film Festival, I was approached about joining their staff as a columnist for their column, Dig Deeper, where we take a look at movies that may not have the most mainstream recognition and really kind of dig into the behind the scenes and the, what they're about and, and things like that. And I had a blast writing my first article for them. My first column, it's about the film City of the Dead, starring Chris Lee and awesome film. And I'd like to think it's an awesome column. Head over to strange-eons.com to check that out. And stay tuned because here within the next few days, probably beginning of next week, I'm going to put together a little YouTube video promoting that as well. Again, there's going to be links in the show notes to all of this. So if you want to go contribute to the Lovecraft Film Festival's Kickstarter, if you want to check out the Rose City Comic Con or the Hall of Heroes Comic Con, or you want to pre-order your issue of Strange Eons Magazine for my debut as a columnist of Dig Deeper, well, all you got to do is head over to monsterkidradio.net to follow the link, and then you can make that happen. <laughs> Coming on stage, it's no show for sissies. See two out-of-this-world horror shows in person. See Dr. Ragnar and his nightmare of movie monsters. You'll see the screen's latest and most horrible movie monsters alive in person. See the teenage Frankenstein, the fly, the colossal beast, the daughter of Dracula, Rodan, and the flying monster. These monsters are not on film, but alive in person on the stage and in the audience. See what happens when teenage Frankenstein meets Dragula's daughter. All this plus stage show number two spooks a poppin'. We warn you, this is the most on stage, in person, two blood warming horror shows. Did he die, man? Well, Dr. Pepper signed the certificate natural causes, but I should have thought from the look of the poor fellow that he died of fright. This is a frightened village. Here, it is wiser to close your ears to a scream in the night. In this place, even familiar things take on an odd and terrifying significance. A funeral moves under the cloak of night. But no one inquires who has died, nor why the corpses are dispatched with such desperate haste. Starring Peter Cushing as the parson who knew every secret of the night creatures. <laughs> Yvonne Romaine and Oliver Reed as two young people who loved in the shadow of terror. I've always been respectful to you, haven't I? But I've had to keep my real feelings to myself until now. Patrick Allen as the courageous Captain Collier who sailed the seven seas in search of danger and found it in The Night Creatures. Come back, 
back through the fire and water network. Come back with the supermates. I said, come back. Back to the house of Franklin Stein. The Supermates present four blood-curdling films with an all-star cast. Lon Chaney Jr. I know you'll think I'm crazy, but in a half an hour the moon will rise and I'll turn into a wolf. Gary Busey. I'm a little too old to be playing the Hardy Boys meet Reverend Werewolf. Christina Ricci. I'd love to have a tame one, but I wouldn't have the heart to cage him. Corey Hayne. I want you to turn this into a silver bullet. Bela Lugosi. You should be careful. A person can get killed that way. Johnny Depp. No, you must believe me. It was a horseman, a dead one. Headless. Peter Cushing. Have you heard of the cult of the undead? Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Do you know what could happen if I meet Dracula in the woods? I'll bite. Oh, no, you got to stand in line. Plus four monstrous battles with your favorite comic book heroes. I sense you're trying to resist this evil, Batman. Open your mind so I can help you. Destroy me, Sean. Booster Gold, Vampire Slayer. This September and October, come back to the Fire and Water Network and the home of horror and heroes. I believe you're in the house of Dracula right now. No, wrong address. Come back to the house of Franklin Stein. Back. Back. Yes, master. Get these on Dracula. <laughs> Come on the most fantastic and terrifying journey of your life, 4,000 miles into the center of the Earth, to a world within our world, at the Earth's core. Now, American International Pictures hurls you at supersonic speeds with Doug McClure and Peter Cushing to a world peopled by creatures beyond your wildest nightmares. The Mosops, whose fiery breath withers trees and plants. The vicious Mayhars, bird women who feed on human flesh. The giant Boz, lizard-like behemoths with poison fangs. The cruel Sagoths, animal-faced soldiers of Pellucidar, ruled by the Princess Dia, whose seductive beauty can drive men mad. Come on the most incredible voyage ever dared by man. Edgar Rice Burroughs at, at the, the Earth's, Earth's core. core. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. This is Count Vlad, but you may recognize me by my more familiar name, Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. In your parlance, you might call these revelations spoilers. You know how the children of the night Ah, I mean monster kids can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned, and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Listeners, you know we can't talk about Edgar Allan Poe. We can't talk about Edgar August Poe Month here on Monster Kid Radio without talking about a film featuring one of my absolute favorite. And, you know, for the past year and a half, two years, three years, he's been my favorite classic monster movie actor, Bela Lugosi. So we're going to talk about Murders in the Room Morgue. And when Jonathan Inbody said, hey, let's talk about that movie, I jumped on it. I'm like, we, we got to talk about this film. Welcome to the show, sir. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very surprised somebody else didn't already claim this one because I really like this movie. You know, I think when it comes to Poe adaptations, everybody goes to the Vincent Price. And rightfully so. Those movies are fantastic. Oh, yeah, they're great. But, you know, this was not necessarily the first, but I mean, it's Lugosi. But we got to talk about it. I, I cannot oh, talk yeah. about it. I've gone way too long not talking about Lugosi here on the show. <laughs> Oh, he's fantastic. And he's he like has the right amount of ham for every part. Like he knows exactly how cheesy to be. And it's great. You know, it's cheesy, but it's still dark. Oh, yes. And it, it's pretty early in his Hollywood career. So things are still a little stagey and, and mm. melodramatic and over the top. But you know what? 
I love it. Yeah, this whole movie feels very like German expressionist. Like everybody is still doing the stagey acting. The makeup is very like white and black. It's wonderful. Characters who shouldn't even have makeup. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Everybody's got makeup slathered on them. It's exactly right. It's slathered on them. You know, that said, there are some things in this movie, the film work, the cinematography that do seem a little progressive, a little bit more contemporary at least, maybe more 40s and 50s. There's some camera movement things happening here that you didn't see in, say, Dracula the year before or Frankenstein the year before. And I don't know if that was Robert Flory, the cinematographer. I don't know much about the director, but there's some really interesting things here. But, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. We got to start at the beginning here. (laughs) We got to start at the beginning. In the beginning of every episode, you know what happens. Oh. We got to play a round of the Classic Five, sir. Oh, of course. So for listeners who don't know, the Classic Five is a game that we play here on Monster Kid Radio. I've got a deck of cards here, and each one of these cards has a question about classic monster movies, this or that, which one do you prefer better, that sort of thing. There are no wrong answers. Call it a game. Call it an icebreaker. We call it the Classic Five. Are you ready to play, sir? I am ready. Much more confident this time than the last time. (laughs) And I believe you've got a deck coming to you in the mail right now as of this recording. Uh, When this episode comes out, it better have gotten to you by the... (laughs) Yeah, I would hope so. That'd be good. But it is on the way. There is a home game available, and I'll talk about that at the end of the show. Here we go. Card number one. Who else could have or should have played Frankenstein's Monster? This is going to be a little bit of a weird one, but I thought of it actually shortly after the last time we we recorded. Um, Woody Strode from the spaghetti westerns i think would be a great frankenstein's monster wow right it was one of those things where as soon as i thought of it i was like why did that movie not happen very okay i'm on board let's make somebody invent that time machine (laughs) (laughs) or just edit footage from kioma and just make him like green (laughs) we'll see what we can do with it in editing you know (laughs) right on i like it i like it a lot all right card number two Which movie do you prefer? It, The Terror from Beyond Space, or It Conquered the World? Ooh, I haven't watched either of those in a very long time. Oh, no. Uh, hmm. I might actually have to look up the difference between those because it has been a very long time since I've seen either of them. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, no. So It Conquered the World was the upside down carrot creature? Oh, yes, and, that one is absolutely delightful. And, and <laughs> It, The Terror from Beyond Space is like the proto-alien film. Yeah, I gotta go with upside down carrot creature. Okay. Like, okay. All right. All there's right. nothing more wonderful than that. That's true. Like, That's true. You got, you know, it's Patrick Corman and Bronson Canyon. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. What's this all about? What's everybody running from? It's the end of everything. What do you mean? I'm not arguing theory, General. I'm here to ask you, to beg you, to save your own world. It, 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 the most most fascinating fascinating mastermind man man can conceive. A monster that can control all sources of the Earth's power. Able to pull man-made spaceships from their orbits. Making of those it chooses slaves. Of this woman, a willing handmaiden. Of the chief of police, a cold-blooded killer. Well, I've known you for five years. You just killed a man in cold blood. Why? I'll have to place you under protective custody. Peter Graves, the scientist who fought it. Beverly Garland, who believed her love stronger than it. Lee Van Cleef, whose brilliant mind was captured by it. Are you really ready to stop loving me? I'll need you even when no emotion exists. For a few dollars, you can can hire a woman who'll fit all your fetishes. She'll match your requirements perfectly. Then if you ever get tired of it, you can always run down to the employment agency for another. You'll know terror to freeze your blood. You'll feel the heart-stopping strength of the most fearful monster ever known. You think you're going to make a slave of the world? I'll see you in hell first. It conquered the world. And I love the cheapness of that one. Like, there's there's such great cheapness in all of Corman's stuff, but there's a couple that are exceptionally cheap. <laughs> Card number three, this is from our Hammer expansion deck. Who is your favorite actress to appear in a Hammer film? Ooh, that one is also a tough one, because I'm still working on my way through uh, the Hammer library. Uh, let's see. There was the one you talked to either at 
this monster bash or a recent one because I was just listening to an episode of uh, Veronica Carlson, who was yes. at last year's monster bash. Yeah. Yes, she is absolutely fantastic. She's wonderful. I'm working on some sound on an upcoming movie that she's in, and I had the uh, the assembly cut playing in the living room, and my wife walks in. She, she was just taken by her. So she's beautiful, mm. and she, she still is. I mean, yeah, she's amazing. Is that uh, House of the Gorgon that she's going to be in? Is that the one? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know how official – well – I guess I'm a, I am listed on the IMDb, so I guess it's official. Yeah, I'm doing sound on that for for Joshua. Kennedy, yeah, I didn't so. mean to make you. Oh you know, no, yeah. By the time <laughs> this comes out, no, I'm yeah, no. I was looking at that, and Brenda walks in, and she's like, she was just struck by her, just how wonderful mm-hmm. she is. So she has a great presence. Oh gosh, she's so good, so good. All right, card number four. This is oh, this is from the Monster Bash expansion. Vincent Price or Boris Karloff? Oh man, I mean that's oh. These are all tough, but that one is a particularly tough one. Uh, I got to go with Vincent Price. He has a great range, and and not that Bo- uh, Boris Karloff doesn't. I feel like there's kind of more life to the way that Vincent Price, like he brings this staginess to everything that's really wonderful. And I absolutely love stuff like Abominable Dr. Fibes, which is like one of my favorite movies. Like it's amazing. So I have to give it to him, if only because of the joy that he's brought me through that movie. Okay. Well, that would have played very well to the Monster Bash crowd since Victoria Price was there. So you would have gone right. along with her just fine. All right. Card number five, final card, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad or Jason and the Argonauts? Oof. Oh, man. <laughs> These are good questions. These are great questions. They're just brutally hard. <laughs> um uh, I got to go with Jason and the Argonauts. Okay. I, uh, that one was one of the first Harryhausen movies I saw. And it, it's just always kind of connected with me in that way. Like the whole fight with the skeletons, Talos, like there's so many sequences in that that I absolutely adore. And I, I love Sinbad, but Jason and the Argonauts for me is is like always the one that I go to when I feel like watching a Harryhausen. Now from the makers of Sinbad, Columbia Pictures presents Jason and the Argonauts. The mightiest band of warriors the world has ever known. Turn back, Jason! We're trapped! Sailing to the ends of the earth, battling against an incredible number of obstacles. Where will you find this miracle? I have heard there is a tree at the end of the world, with a fleece of gold hanging in its branches. In search of the fabulous magic golden fleece, Jason and the Argonauts, caught in the clutches of the towering bronze giant Talos, battered by treacherous falling rocks, taming vulturous harpies, facing the dreaded seven-headed hydra, battling the merciless army of skeletons. Jason and the Argonauts, the classic story of Jason, a man who challenged the gods. Medea, a temple dancer who betrayed a kingdom for love. The Argonauts, the mightiest band of warriors the world has ever known. Jason and the Argonauts, a classic adventure story brought to the screen through the incredible special effects magic of Dinorama. Jason and the Argonauts, the search that became a legend. That was the classic five. How do you feel, sir? Pretty good. Right on. See, you did fine. You win. I did okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we got the classic five out of the way. You want to get back to what we were talking about a second ago? Oh, yes, absolutely. Murders in the Rue Morgue. You know, it didn't do very well when it first came out back in the 30s. But over the years, I feel like it's gotten a lot more respect. Unfortunately, not enough respect for Universal to put it out on Blu-ray. I'm so mad at that because it looks beautiful, but it would look so much better with like a nice restored print. Oh, my goodness. You have no idea. Uh, I, <laughs> it killed me. Universal. You know, I'm glad they put their stuff out on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. But there's so much that they're not putting out on Blu-ray that I wish they did. Yeah, I, it's one of those things where I wish that they would sell off some of their, like, the, the ones that they're not interested in releasing to something like Scream Factory. Some other company that would curate it and, and take care of it in a way that they don't seem willing to. And I know they won't do that, but it'd be really great if they did. You know, some of their products, some of their movies, and, and I still don't understand this. In Germany, you can get things like the Monolith Monsters or the Incredible Shrinking Man on Blu-ray. Really? Wow. That they've licensed these titles out to some other outfit, and I forget who it is, and it's awfully early, so I don't remember anyway. Mm. Um, (laughs) But 
Yeah, you can get some of this stuff on Blu-ray. Revenge of the Creature in 3D. Really? It's available on Blu-ray. Oh, wow. In Germany. That's awesome. Now, it's not the fancy 3D. You've got to work, you know, yeah, but sure. still, yeah, it, yeah. it's out there. And and they've even got a couple of special features on it. Nothing over the top or anything, but there's like a little 15-minute interview with Jack Arnold on there. So there are masters of it out there. They just don't want to put it out. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand. Yeah, especially like Incredible Shrinking Man is is very like that's a great film. Like that would absolutely sell. Mm-hmm. Like Murders in the Room Org should sell. I don't know that it would because this does seem to be like a redheaded stepchild of the Universal catalog, but it should. I think people would buy it. I would think so if you did it right. If you packaged it right. Don't I don't yeah, know. Yeah, certainly. You know, would they want to spend the money on doing anything other than like a manufactured on demand disc? I don't know. Mm. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like if they did it right, it could it could sell. And there are Legosi historians out there that I'm sure would jump at the chance. Oh yes, to to do a commentary or or a special feature, getting Gary Rhodes involved. Heck, I'll do it. You know? <laughs> we volunteer. <laughs> we yeah, and I'll do. I work With cheap. Commentaries. I work cheap. <laughs> Universal. I work real cheap, <laughs> especially now. So. That's that's one of the things I love about like living in an age where forgotten movies are getting like nice Blu-ray prints and nice like curated Blu-rays with special features and stuff is it's so nice to get the opinion of like professionals on a lot of these movies that I love. Like it's really interesting to have people talk about them in a really academic way because this movie especially has a lot that you can dig into. Right. Now, I, I do want to point out that I was just saying that I'll do it and then you went to professionals. I'm like, well, okay, let's 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 steer. <laughs> oh, come on now. Um it's- Close enough to professional. Professional is just somebody who's labeled that. <laughs> Close enough to professional. Okay, I'm going to put that on my resume as I'm looking for work. How about that? <laughs> I'm close enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This was a movie that ended up being given to Robert Flory and Lugosi because they were taken off of Frankenstein. And, and I don't know what the truth is. There, I've read so many stories over the years about why Lugosi didn't do Frankenstein. The makeup didn't work. He didn't want to do it. Whatever. And when James Whale came in and they gave the film to him, you know, Flory got kind of shunted off to the side and was given this film as – I don't know, booby prize, something. I'm not sure. I guess, yeah. Like I said, I don't know much about Robert Flory as a director, although after having watched this movie a couple of times now in preparation for this, I need to know more about this guy because he really brings a unique eye. You can tell he knows what he's doing and, and is very direct about the way he's putting the film together. Some movies from around this time feel like they're not quite used to what movies are, but this guy, like, he gets it. He gets this, the language of cinema in a way that is really impressive for 1932. Yeah. Now, the filmmaking technology is in a period of lots of advancements happening. There's a lot oh, yes. of things going on with sound, especially. You know, they're doing silent films, and, and those are working just fine. And then they start bringing in sound, and suddenly the camera has to be stationary again because they don't know how to mic everything up without having the camera pick up or the camera mm-hmm. make a lot of noise. It gets picked up or whatever. So if you watch a lot of movies from this era, they are very stagey and, you know, it's just by necessity, not that they didn't know they were doing. They just couldn't move things around. Or a lot of the directors were still working with that kind of stage-like mindset, like Todd Browning in the original Dracula. There's a lot of directors that I think took a while to adapt, not just because of the, like, having to have stationary cameras, but I think... Because the atmosphere, like all the actors are still acting very stagey. I feel like as a whole, the movie industry took a little bit to adapt to like, oh, film can be its own thing. It's not just filmed versions of plays with camera tricks in them. Yeah. If you go back and you watch, say, like uh, D.W. Griffith, you know, working on silent film, he he started moving the camera around and that sort of thing. But if you look Mm -hmm. at films prior to what he started doing, yeah, it's just a stage play and somebody shot it and that's about it sometimes they're not even Mm -hmm. edited you know it's just one long kind of thing with a couple of title cards and that's that so things things did change a little bit and i'm fascinated by this era of of hollywood history which again is (laughs) i'm so upset i don't know much more about this guy Uh, because when i look at his filmography and you know he'd been doing film he'd been working in film since you know the late 20s Mm -hmm. wow well, and he did a bunch of television, didn't he? I thought I saw that on his IMDb. Yeah, he did. I uh, did three episodes of The Twilight Zone, an episode of The Outer Limits, 
Oh, wow. Uh, five episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, an episode of Thriller. So he did a lot of, not just TV, but genre TV, but he also no, did some sure. other things as well. Uh, Adventures in Paradise, The Barbara Stanwyck Hour, things along those lines. But yeah, this guy, I mean, he had such an eye and, and brought mm-hmm. such a unique take to it. And I can't help but wonder what Frankenstein would have looked like under his direction. Yeah, it would be it would be different because James Whale is, is like very much an Artur of that time. Like he he also seems like somebody with a very clear vision and a very good way of of making it happen, you know? So I'd be very curious to see if if we could go back in time and let Robert Flory do a version of, of Frankenstein, what it would come out the other end as, you, you know, know? What alternate reality did that happen in and how do I get there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know, and, and, and this is one of the things that I love about talking with monster kids. If we had a time machine, we'd go back and see this movie and that movie. None of this go back and, you know, keep World War II from happening. No, you no. Know, this is, That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go see Phantom of the Opera for the first time, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, what if? What if? Anyway, this is Lugosi's film. I mean, he, he's not the lead, but he's the villain. And I don't know if this movie would have the staying power that I feel it should have without Lugosi as Dr. Miracle. The, the character of Dr. Miracle isn't in the short story. So I, I <laughs> not like, at all. <laughs> I'm like, I. I know that they knew that Lugosi was attached from the start, but it also it, it also kind of feels like they wrote a script, realized it didn't really have an interesting enough character, and we're like, well, he's going to be this crazy doctor guy. Right. <laughs> and it's absolutely wonderful. He does a great job. I don't know if this is the earliest, but this is pretty darn early in Lugosi's Hollywood career for him to be playing a mad scientist type. Yeah, when he had to resort to doing it just to try and pay the bills later on. Right. I, I guess this movie kind of put a damper on his career for a little bit. Um, Cause I guess universal broke the contract after this, after this movie failed. Unfortunately. Yeah. This is also the movie that kind of put Lugosi on the career path that he ended up on, which so wasn't the best. It, you know, Lugosi just didn't get enough respect and I still feel like he doesn't get as much as he should. Like I love Boris Karloff, but I'm a Lugosi guy all the way. Like he's fantastic. See, this is why we get along. <laughs> this is it. That's the one reason. That, that, yeah, that, that's the only reason. <laughs> I mean, after Santo versus the Blob, you know, I got. <laughs> there's got to be something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh, man. It is unfortunate uh, that Lugosi ended up kind of the way that he did. But he left us so many wonderful films like this one, which has, like you said, almost nothing to do with <laughs> the original source material. Um, people weren't reading the way that they can now. Mm. You know, and, and Poe was, I don't know if he was in the public domain at that point or not. I'd have to go and look at my copyright law history. I yeah, I don't think he would be. I don't think so either. Now, and like I said, this isn't the first time Murders in the Room Org was adapted. Mm. I think it was done as a couple of silent films beforehand. One film was lost. Mm. Uh, and the other one I have not seen. Yeah, I haven't This either. is the first time we see the, the Dr. Miracle character. Mm. There is an ape in the original story. Yes, it's an orangutan, I think. Yeah, it's not. Which is like notoriously a peaceful ape. Right? <laughs> Which is, it's weird to to cast that as the murderer. It's also very cute. It's a very cute animal. <laughs> like you can't, it's not scary. Orangutans aren't scary. <laughs> this, this is true. Luckily for this, they got like a chimp to play the, uh, to play Eric the ape in the close-ups and chimps are very scary. That's another complaint that I have about this film. I have a few complaints about this movie. Mm-hmm. And and none of them have to do with the filmmaking or the filmmakers, excuse me. They, they pretty much sure. all have to do with the studio coming in and saying, this is what we got to do. Or sure. we have to go in. And, and like the close-ups of the chimp's face, I, I don't like that at all. I, I just don't. Because there's this awesome gorilla suit stuff going on. This man in ape suit stuff going on with Joe Bonomo playing eric in the long shots or when you have to pick mm. somebody up or go up a ladder or whatever and he's this classic strong man from the 20s and such and i don't know as much as i should about him either even though i've got his autobiography here i just haven't read it yet oh man yeah i mean he did a lot of theatrical work stage work vaudeville all this kind of stuff and mm. i think he did just fine he's not somebody you think about when you think about classic gorilla suit acting you think about gamora yeah, you know, some yes. of these others, but he he gets the movements down. Like he's got it. He's got a good sense of it. He really does, and he can carry the women around like they're nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. It's there's that whole sequence at the end of running on the rooftops where I'm I'm like I'm not like uh, afraid for the characters. I'm afraid for the actress. <laughs> like right every time they like 
almost take a wrong step and go off. I'm like, oh, no, no. <laughs> like, that poor woman. <laughs> 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 yeah, definitely. And, and you know, he's got the build. I mean, he was called Mr. Modern Apollo in a strongman contest. He's got the build and the heft and the strength to it. So every time they cut to a close up of the chimp for Eric, I just, I just. See, I don't, I don't I'm, mind I'm it not. so much. I, I, what I wish that they didn't do is do it so close. And I know they have to do it that close because they're trying to make it match whatever scene they need the insert shots for. Right. But I wish there was some way that they could have done it without like there's one shot at the towards the beginning that there's like badly composited bars of the cage in front of him. And it just completely ruins that shot for me. Like I like seeing the detail of like the real chimp. It adds to the like kind of surreal horror thing that this movie has going on. But there has to have been a better way to edit it so it's not so jarring. Okay. I don't know how, but there has to have been something, you know. And maybe that's a result of the limitations of the filmmaking tech at the time or, or just, I, I don't know. Like I said, it was, it seems like it was a studio mandate. Yes. And I'm sure they had access to the actual chimp for like an hour, you know, and they just got whatever shots <laughs> they could get and put it in. Like, I'm sure that they weren't, yeah. they, they didn't have somebody really coaching that, that chimp all that much to get good reactions or like what they actually need. They just filmed it for 20 minutes and cut that up and put it into the movie. You know, that makes sense. So that that's what they had to do. Cause you don't, Hmm trying to think I, I haven't gone back to do this and maybe i will again because i do love this movie just go back in time how long the chimp is on screen oh sure yeah it's probably not much just just yeah i can't imagine i mean to me it stands out because i i wanted to see the man in suit mm. <laughs> i don't need to see a chimp yeah. but you know that yeah whatever yeah we, we can still be friends that's fine <laughs> um <laughs> i just don't like chimps and i find them frightening <laughs> <laughs> The other big thing that the studio did to this film is this film is only 60 minutes. It's very short, but my reading is telling me that it actually was a bit longer. There's like an extra 20 minutes out there that the studio chopped. I would love to see that 20 minutes because this movie oh, is already man. incredibly dark, surprisingly violent and, and very much not for kids. Like this is the most pre-code movie I've ever seen. It's so pre-code. <laughs> You know, to come out of Universal mm -hmm. and, and to have some of the Universal mainstays in it with Lugosi, I, yeah. I'm astounded this movie it's, actually got made. I know that Robert Flory wanted to be more true to the book or the, the original short story and the Universal was like, well, we need a monster movie. So they kind of went back and forth on it. Sure. I would love to see that extra footage just to see what Robert Flory and company were doing. Oh, absolutely. And I, I'm sure that footage is long gone. Oh, yeah. I'm sure Universal didn't save any of that because why would they? And no, nobody really thought about, you know, post-release marketing mm -hmm. of these movies. But man, again, that time machine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I feel like that would be what I would do with a time machine is just go and get deleted scenes from movies I like. Just go and find <laughs> go, the negatives before they can get chopped up. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. You find the 20 minutes of this, find the spider pit sequence, you know, all That'd that stuff. That'd be the best one to find. Oh, that, be fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just to get your hands on that, Oh, man. I know. Just to, oh, like, man. just to have it, to be able to put it into, like, a, a nice release of the film, like, it'd be really great to have extended cuts of, like, movies that are this early. Again, and then put out that awesome Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. You gotta. <laughs> <laughs> Are you listening to us, Universal? I know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> please. Please listen to us. <laughs> it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. It would be flat out amazing. Now, he's not the only... Uh, Lugosi is not the only actor in the film, obviously. There's, there's a whole crew, a whole cast here that overall, I mean, they're kind of exchangeable to me nobody really stands out outside of the detective character pierre dupont yes he's he's definitely the standout and then um the guy who plays his like i don't know i don't know what the guy is like his his friend paul the burt roach i think is the the actor he's also pretty good he's he's like very vaudeville -y and he doesn't have much to do but he's very charming in the one scene that he's prominently featured in very very much so so leon ames and burt roach uh, respectively play pierre and paul yes they're roommates, right? I was, they share I was very confused as to what their actual relationship was. There was a bit where I was like, is it pre-code enough that they're in a gay relationship? Because when the scene yeah. where it's at their, at their house, Paul is like, I made macaroni. Stop bringing bodies home from the morgue. Like he's, he's cast as like the most stereotypical, like naggy wife. And I was like, this is weird, right? Like, this isn't just me. 
if not for the opening bit where they're all kind of drooling over the dancing girls, yes, I, I would have totally thought that. And and maybe they were putting that in. I don't know. Maybe, would James Whale do something differently with that sequence? I oh, probably certainly. I mean, it, it's it's really over the top. You know, mm-hmm. you're always bringing bodies home. Why are you always bringing bodies home? I made dinner. Come over here. Come over here. Drink. You know. And he's not even listening to him. Yeah. And it really is this this odd kind of relationship between the two. But uh, basically, the roomies, I guess. <laughs> And I guess kind I of guess. partners because they like talk about anatomy like they're both medical students. But then like, I don't know, Paul doesn't really have enough to do in the script for you to know who he is. It's weird. I wonder if that's and, part and, of that and, 20 and, minutes that got cut. I was going to say, maybe the 20 <laughs> minutes would have given us more Paul and Pierre action. It's just action. all Paul, that 20 minutes. Yeah. It's all him. <laughs> He's just yelling at people about not eating his macaroni for 20 minutes. <laughs> But I've got macaroni. (laughs) The macaroni is almost ready. Stop messing with bodies. Get over here. Uh, they they are a lot of fun together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pierre is is our lead, and and he's the one who tries to figure everything out. And this story, the original short story by Poe, is credited as being the the first detective fiction story, the first story of detective fiction. And you can see, even in this film, I can see – where some of that might have come in. And I know Poe actually used the Pierre Dupont character a couple of times in other stories, and this character would actually end up being turned into Sherlock Holmes in an adaptation later on. And you can see a little bit of Sherlock and Watson sure. in the relationship here. I haven't read the original short story in so, so long, and I wanted to before this. Yeah, I, I, I had the exact yeah. same thing happen where I was like, and I'm going to read the short story, like I'm going to be so prepared. And then we got to this morning and I was like, oh, <laughs> I forgot to read the short story. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm familiar enough with the short story to kind of sound like I know what I'm talking about, I hope. Yeah, it's, it's um, fairly but... <laughs> basic as short stories go. It's not that long. Mm. And, and again, it's it does have some elements that would eventually turn up in the movie. Uh, Dr. Miracle's not there. So it's got a, a black strike against it for me, but you know, <laughs> well, it definitely feels like when they were going to make this movie, they had just seen cabinet of Dr. Caligari mm. and decided to pull in a bunch of elements from that. You know, like Miracle is very much like that same kind of big tent, uh, ringleader type, even though he's not literally a ringleader in this. And then he has, Yanosh, who is basically like Cesare, but, I don't know, is I, I have a lot of questions about you know, but we'll get back to that. But very much feels like they watched a lot of German expressionism before they made this mm-hmm. because it feels like it slots right into German expressionism. Well, you know, let's let's talk about Janusz real quick because he's played by Noble Johnson, who does turn up in a number of 30s and 40s genre films and non-genre stuff. But I mean, we've talked about him here on the show in the past. He was in King Kong, The Most Dangerous Game, you know, some classic films. Uh, I, I again, he's one of these guys I don't know as much about as I should. But he, all I know is he has an awesome name. Oh yeah, no, Noble John, <laughs> the best. It's name. great. Yeah. You know, and he turned up in a number of other movies that I do need to see that are on my two watch lists than they were before I even, mm-hmm. you know, talked about this movie or whatever with you. But, <laughs> but like he said, a Fu Manchu film. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just check that one out. He played a lot of Native Americans. So in this, his character is listed by the credits of the film as Yanosh the Black One. Is he supposed to be African? I don't know. Because Yanosh is not an African name. And Miracle is is very much coded as like Eastern European. I don't know if it's supposed to be that Yanosh, that he's an African that Miracle like picked up and named Yanosh and that he has some other actual name. Like uh, that's one of the things that I kind of wish they would actually get into is Yanosh is in the movie, but he doesn't really have much of a presence. And I know he's supposed to be like strong, silent type, but they don't give him enough to do that you still feel his presence in the scenes he's in. Right. He's kind of like an afterthought. Yeah. In, in a lot of sequences, not really much for him to do there. Uh, Noble Johnson was an African-American, so I'm really hoping by calling him Janos the Black One in the credits, they weren't just saying, hey, he's the black guy. Yeah. I, that's, I well, really hope that's not what it was. And they, they seem to have given him like gray makeup. Like he doesn't look, it's confusing the makeup job that they've done on him and everything about his character I'm, I'm confused about. But yeah, he, he's uh, the other part of Miracle's trio of terror, you know, him and Carrick <laughs> and, and, and Janosch. Uh, Miracle is, uh, he's a scientist, but he's, is it a circus? Is it a carnival? He, he's kind of 
traveling in that circle, um, th- there's a sideshow involved. And I talked about the opening sequence. There's this big dancing number with, with dancing girls, and the men have their women with them as they're watching them. And <laughs> there's a good five minutes of let's look at the dancing girls and let's cut to the men watching them, and they're making all sorts of comments. Are they really brown or are they just painted that way? Well, maybe I should get up there and find out. Well, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Oh man. And when I heard that line, I was like, is that, is that like a meta thing? Do they, are they making a commentary about like brown face? And I was like, they can't be. That's just like, it's just weird that, 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 that they like accidentally described exactly what they were doing. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this whole movie in a lot of ways is very much a product of its time. It has a lot of like the specter of racism hanging over it in, in various degrees of, um, severity and that opening sequence, you have like the Arab girls, you have the native American, uh, men that are dancing. It overall feels very much of its time is probably the best way to say it, but you know, it, it ought to be addressed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but yeah, I mean, we, we, if we don't talk about it, we're not doing history. Yeah. Right. You know, we're, we're doing a disservice to Hollywood history. There is, and, and I had forgotten about this when I sat down to watch this the first time to, to talk about it here on the show. Cause like I said, I've watched it a couple of mm-hmm. times now. I had forgotten that as we're kind of tracking through and there's another awesome camera move as we're kind of tracking through the crowd. Yeah. There's that circle of native Americans doing a, a stereotypical kind of war dance thing. Just, just kind of there. Yeah. And, and like the, um, Camille, the female lead is like, Oh, do you want to check if they're painted? And the guy's like, Oh, no, no, no. You know, I'll take their word for it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just kind of there. And, that whole that whole opening scene, and I know that some of the scenes, I guess, were moved around in editing. I guess it was supposed to open with Miracle killing the sex worker that happens like 10 or 20 minutes in. Right. Okay. So that opening scene is very jarring because you're just kind of dropped in to like a very – you've got a lot of stuff going on. You have a lot of characters that are being introduced. And a lot of the dialogue is just them making dirty jokes. Yeah it's good to introduce them that way. Like, cause it, you get the dynamic, you get the sense of the dynamic between all of them. But at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, after like the third or fourth, I was like, what, why is this the scene you're starting with? Yeah. And like learning that they jumbled around the, the movie and editing makes it make a lot more sense. It does feel weird. It's an odd choice for sure uh, to do it that way. By doing it that way, I wonder if maybe it makes the rest of the film a little more scary or terrifying because we are starting with this kind of vaudevillian let's make a couple of cracks here and there and talk about how the men want to see all the the women naked basically and uh yeah. <laughs> will you dance like that for me <laughs> like come on oh, really <laughs> come on there's there's such a degree of like perviness in that opening scene where i'm like this is very surprising like this is again this is very pre-code mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i mean i love it don't don't, don't i'm not mm-hmm. and, and you know we're talking about things here that I do seem a little odd or out of place or maybe even a little critical or laughing at it. But the truth is I adore this film. Uh, it is, mm-hmm. it's, it's gorgeous. I love the way it's put together. And I mentioned earlier, some of the camera moves, you know, the tracking shot at the beginning, the one camera shot that sticks out to me is when she's on the swing. Oh yes. That looks wonderful. Oh my. And, and why, I don't know if anybody had done anything like this beforehand to this extent. And if they have, Listen, and you know about it, listeners, let me know. But they've mounted this camera so that it's attached to the swing as she's swinging, this woman swinging back and forth while she's having a conversation with uh, Pierre. And it's just very cool. Oh, yeah. It, and it's it's a long like scene of it, too. There's There's like a good minute to two minutes of just that. It's really impressive. It's very, very neat. So if nothing else, go watch this movie for that. Oh, yeah. And and I mean, you should watch it for the like kind of surreal horror vibe that it has going, because that's something that I feel like has kind of splintered off into its own. Like David Lynch basically has that whole genre, like that subgenre now. Mm. And that surrealist horror stuff is really, really interesting. And especially at this point in Hollywood history, when you have the German expressionist movement, like there's so much of that going on in a really interesting way before everything kind of got codified into here's how we do horror movies. You know, it's a really good point too. that. They're still kind of trying to figure it out. You know, there had been scary film moments up to the thirties, obviously phantom hunchback, you know, and a few other mm. things other people were doing as well, but yeah, they still haven't, you're right. Codified or, or really decided upon. This is what a horror movie is. And you have an opportunity to make some, or take some real chances. And this one does it. Yeah. And they, they do. 
Yeah. Especially, you mentioned the sex worker earlier, especially with her. Yes, absolutely. There's so oh much my. darkness. Like it's that whole scene. It starts with a knife fight between two sailors. That's mostly on screen. I, I was really surprised by that too. Wow. You see, you don't necessarily see a close up of the knife going into somebody, but they do take a moment to make sure we have a close shot of the knife as it's being thrust down out of screen. Yes. That's pretty intense. The only time they cut away is at direct points of stabbing. Otherwise you just see two guys having a knife fight. It's a, um, almost jarringly real moment in this movie. Like it's, it looks just like it's just two guys having a fight. Like there's, there's just, yeah, it, it looks <laughs> really good and it's intense. And you, you, while well, you don't see blood spurting or anything like that, you know, the special effects technology and makeup isn't super advanced or whatever, but it still feels violent mm. and visceral. Yeah, well, and and knife fights I've found in in movies always have that like there's there's something personal about knives that there isn't about guns. So I'm kind of glad that they went with knives and brawling because it adds to that like, you know, the thing with Doctor Miracle is he's very much a like a surgical killer, and I like that they kind of carry over that almost intimacy of violence throughout this whole movie. Like nobody is shot in this movie with the exception of the ape. Everybody else is stabbed or strangled or some other way that's very personal. That's a, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't considered that, but that's a really good point there too. And we've been calling her a sex worker. I don't think they ever flat out say that's what she does. At one point when the Yeah. I don't know if he's the mortician or whoever it is that keeps record of all the dead bodies coming in when he asks what her occupation was, they they're very cagey about it. Yes. Her and that whole sequence and this is not the only time Lugosi would have somebody up in a crucifix position. Uh, <laughs> when I saw yeah. that, I forgot that it was there. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's the same, uh, you know, cross or X that they put Karloff on later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. that they, they probably would have just kept it in some back room and been like, oh, we should use this in the next movie. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but they do have a woman attached to an X uh, or, or cross like, you know, basically an X. And yeah. he's, what is Morocco's point here? He, he is trying to. I'm very confused because, <laughs> okay. So this is another thing that I feel like, even though it is pre code, there's a lot of euphemistic um, theming in this mm -hmm. that is either about like race mixing um, themes of like being afraid of, of immigrants. There's a whole scene later when there's like, three immigrants that are brought out to be like kind of clowns. And then also to be like throwing each other under the bus. Like this whole movie has that, that a kind of undercurrent that is unpleasant in a very specific way. And that goes back to that. Like it's of its time, but the stuff with Dr. Miracle's experiments, especially it feels like what was intended in maybe not in the original script, but at least what is being implied by the original script is that Miracle wants Eric, the ape, the like beast with a soul or whatever he calls it to mate with these women that he's kidnapping. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's creepy. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, that's just creepy. And they, they settle for, they settle for injecting blood, but it's very euphemistic. It's very, um, it's very pre-code. It, yeah. That's probably the best way to put it. It's very pre-code. They, they could get away with and do some, pretty dangerous things oh yeah in terms of storytelling and what they were gonna what they were willing to put on screen mm -hmm. and they they go almost as far as having Lugosi call the woman a whore basically yeah he says uh, like, they, they really go all the way up to your beauty was a lie or something where it's very like it's very slutchy it, it is your blood is unpure well what is that supposed to mean well you know what it's supposed to mean you know it's it's very um yeah dark and and not something that you'd associate with even something like Dracula, which is all about the blood. Yeah. Well, this has some elements that feel like they carried over from the novel of Dracula. Like in the novel of Dracula, in, in like the details they give about the way Dracula looks, he has like a big mustache, but he also has a unibrow mm -hmm. and his hair is very unkept. Like Miracle in this looks the way that Dracula is described with the exception of the mustache in the original novel. That's another really good point. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm sure Jack Pierce said the makeup here. 
Oh yeah, he did. Yeah, Pierce was involved. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> sounds about yeah, right. Sounds about right. Uh, that that weird thick unibrow, which the first time you see, it's a little off putting. I'm like, wait, wait a minute, is that a unibrow? <laughs> but then it just kind of becomes part of the character. Well, and I, I think it, it again is is one of those things that's very like it's typifying the stereotype of of Eastern Europeans, and goes back to that overall like the fear of the other is very present in this whole movie, mm-hmm. and it's it's probably best embodied by that unibrow and by miracle being treated as this, like they they treat him like he's smart, but they also treat him like, like that because he's trying to teach what they identify as like a secular idea in evolution, that that somehow makes him immoral, which is really interesting. Cause that again, goes back to the views of the time. Right. There's a lot to really look at here, kind of between the lines and behind the scenes to kind of see, what people kind of thought about the other, the alien, uh, the, the Europeans coming out. There are some Europeans here that don't have that same treatment. There are witnesses to yes. the crime. There's a German, there's an Italian that are brought in. And yeah, that whole sequence has played a little light, but you know, they're, they're okay. They're at least. Yes. They're, they're not demonized exactly. in the way that miracle is. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if it's the unibrow. I don't know what it was. I am also a big fan of young Lugo- younger Lugosi uh, from this era because I like to have – there's just something about his hair, man. I love his curled up hair, his hair kind of all over the – I love it. He looks so very much like a scientist. He really does. <laughs> you know? I know in, in Dracula, it's you know, slicked back and you see the widow's peak and all that. And, and that looks mm. great too. But there's just something about his – long sleeves whirled up and you know he's hunched over a table and he's doing all this stuff and the hair is kind of dangling down there's just something about it that looks so good oh yes and and the way he carries himself in this movie is so he he has this great like body language and charisma where he's just constantly like moving aside like he's about to show you something really interesting like he's about to like bow and point to something you should be looking at in a way that really like <laughs> It just, everything about him is so theatrical in exactly the right way. It's a really great performance. It really is. And any complaints that that people might have about this movie being too stagey or theatrical or or over the top, keep in mind, Miracle is set up at a sideshow. Everything there is over the top. So it it blends in. It fits. It fits really Mm -hmm. well. It is his job to be a ham. It really is. And even when you don't see him on screen directly, even if it's just his shadow, he is working his body in a way like when Eric finally turns on him and, and you have the strangulation scene, spoiler, uh, <laughs> you, it, it looks good because all you see is the shadows. But again, Legosi is working those shadows. Oh, yeah. That, that is one of the first times outside of German expressionism, again, that I keep bringing up. Um, that is one of the first times I've seen a, a shadow be hammy. Like he does. <laughs> I, I don't know how he does it, but he's just a brilliant physical actor. Mm hmm. He really was. He really, really was. This isn't the only time you see the shadow work happening. There is a, a sequence that could have come from Nosferatu when you have mm-hmm. uh, Eric's hand casting a shadow over Camille's head, basically, as he's coming into the room to get her. So you, yes, you, you do have that. Very creepy. Oh, Eric is bad news, man. There's an unsettling nature to that whole, like, whether it's the ape suit or the chimp inserts, there's a really unsettling nature to Eric that is that is genuinely frightening. Truly. Truly. Unfortunately, it's also, well, unfortunately for Miracle, I guess, not necessarily unfortunately for Camille, <laughs> but unfortunately for Eric, Eric leaving ape for behind is ultimately what kind of seals the deal for and, and helps Pierre and company figure out what's going on. And, mm-hmm. you know, they'll go and save Camille from Miracle. But of course, Miracle's killed a few people up until this point. We've talked about the, the woman who works the streets. Is that what they call her in the credits? Uh, the, the street walker. I can't. Yeah, I think it's street walker. They, they give her some fancy woman of the streets is how she's credited. Play, oh, woman of the streets. Played yeah. by, Again, very euphemistic. Oh, very, very. She's played by Arlene Francis. And uh, I think this was her first film. Hmm. So <laughs> what, a, what a great way to get started in Hollywood, yeah. huh? <laughs> Man, what a start. <laughs> Although I guess that's, that still happens today. You know, people starting their career in low-budget horror movies. So, Oh, yeah, or just being a corpse on Law & Order. You know, like there's so, <laughs> many, there's so many of those like little jobs. The way that sequence is shot with her strapped up and the blood and, oh, your blood is impure, and then they got to get rid of the body and the way they just dump her. Oh. It, it's, it's, there's such a, like a genuine, um, just the way he doesn't, he disregards her even after death where he just dumps the body in the river, like no care is put into it whatsoever. There's something really sickening just about the casualness 
with which he does. It is. It's just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Eh, whatever. Trash it goes with the trash. Basically. You know? Yeah, basically. It's, it's just, messed it's, up. It's garbage. You know, we, we used it up. Oh, well, go give me another one. You know, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> You know, I said earlier that some of the other cast members don't necessarily stand out. And that's not to say I don't like the rest of the cast. I mean, there are some people that are fun to watch. Obviously, the guy who works in the morgue or whatever his title is, he, yeah. he's, he's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. You know, he's kind of fun. Uh, he's what? Uh, Darcy Corrigan is the name of the actor there. The morgue keeper, I guess they call him. And he turned up in a few other movies and that sort of thing. Didn't do a heck of a lot. Um, but, you know, he's fun to watch. You know? Yeah, he's got the right kind of face for this kind of movie too. Like he, it's it, the lights really work really nice. He's like a great character actor for this kind of role. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I'm a film score junkie, I pay attention to these kinds of things, and I didn't notice music much in the film at all. Although it does open with Swan Lake, which apparently Universal had one really good song they wanted to use in their horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'll put it in literally everything. Yeah, what? <laughs> Anywhere it fits. Dracu- and even when it doesn't. Dracula, Frankenstein, this one, the mummy. Uh, <laughs> we've got the one piece of music. I don't know if they were trying to make Swan Lake like their. When people hear this, this is their cue. This is their, their, their way <laughs> to think know. Of Dracula. Exactly. They'll think of monsters. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so that turns up in the beginning. But there's, there's very little music throughout the rest of the movie, which, you know, I don't know if it really needed it. It's only 60 minutes long, unfortunately. So if it had been much longer, maybe I'd want a, a more robust score. But again, we're in that time yeah. in Hollywood history where they weren't necessarily doing a lot of that. Yeah, I think it definitely would stand out more if the movie was longer. I, you know, I didn't even think of the fact that, like, uh, you know, the only bit of music I noticed was that Swan Lake right at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't even tell you how many scenes actually had music, you know? So I don't think it's it's all that much of a loss, if only because I just wasn't paying attention to its absence. Maybe. Well, isn't that what you're supposed to do with film scores anyway, is if, if it stands out, it's not doing its job? See, I don't know. I, I kind of disagree with that because I love like John Carpenter's film scores see. and his stuff always stands out like very much because they're synthy and everything. Yeah. And uh, see, that's what they always say. But I always can to it. So <laughs> I I want, you know, the Hans J. Salter. I want to hear it. I want to feel it. You know, I want to hear that. I want uh, I want the Franz Waxman and, and Bride of Dracula, or Bride of Dracula, Bride of Frankenstein. You know, I want that, you know give it to me you know or, or even <laughs> before we started recording we were talking about a a, a movie from the <laughs> 80s that gets more attention than by any right it probably should the best movie of the 80s and and we'll talk about that here in, here in a bit but i mean it's score i would love to get my hands on or soundtrack oh, yeah. but you know absolutely never never really was released but anyway with this film, I think if it was the first time people were exposed to Edgar Allan Poe, they'd be sorely disappointed if they went and read any Edgar Allan Poe. I don't know what Poe's popularity was like in the 30s. I, you know, I know about Lovecraft and Lovecraft worshipped Poe, but I don't know much mm-hmm. about Poe. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure because I'd have to imagine that it, it was probably a thing of Lovecraft care, uh, was in a very specific circle of writers who all loved older writers. So I don't know if it's that he knew Poe because he was in that, like the writing community or if he knew Poe because the average person knew Poe. Yeah. I, I don't know. I really don't know. I wouldn't mind learning more, but again, <laughs> <laughs> You know, and that's the thing. If I could just, you know, I'm not working right now. Maybe I should just sit around and learn all this stuff. <laughs> if I can get paid to learn <laughs> about this kind of stuff, that would be the deal, right? Anyway, uh, Poe, very prolific author, uh, tons of poetry, uh, very influential on the weird fiction front, very influential, obviously, with the detective fiction and just short stories in general, mm-hmm. and spawned a, a whole bunch of films that... Oh, yes. Y- sometimes had nothing to do with Poe other than the title. And of the movies that we've talked about this month during Edgar August Poe, I've enjoyed the heck out of talking about him. And when you mentioned this movie, I'm like, you know, this this is to me the end-all be-all. This is the one that I want to cap everything off with because it's it's Lugosi, it's Universal. Carl Freund's cinematography is gorgeous. The editing is mm-hmm. really good. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the chimp stuff, but, you know whatever that's, that's a minor complaint uh, right yeah when, and when the rest of the movie is is a classic like you can forgive that you know it really is and i know at the time it didn't get the best reviews people said it was trying too hard to be scary and you know i i don't 
see that. I see this as a genuine entry in Universal figuring out what horror movies are. Mm-hmm. And a, a wonderful transfer of this would make me so happy. <laughs> yeah, like, again, it's all about commentaries. Like, it's all about having that, like, that actual curated experience of those old films. Like, that's that's what I would l- absolutely love. Not just for the beautiful print, but to get this movie some attention, you know, because it really deserves it. I agree. I agree. Now, there is a print of this in the Library of Congress, and I don't know when that happens, if they get a pristine print of that or, or, or how that's held or archived. But clearly, Universal's got some source material here. They, the original prints or, or a remaster or something. It did get re-released in the late 40s, so there's got to be something out there. I just, come on, Universal. Come uh, on. Yeah, I'm sure they've got negatives that can be cleaned up to the point that it would be acceptable to to put on a Blu-ray. I think it is just they don't want to spend money on the restoration. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, how well will the uh, the upcoming Blu-ray set do for them and will that push them towards maybe doing some more i don't i don't know hopefully yeah who knows <laughs> there is a master of this out there somewhere because this was released on blu-ray in france huh by elephant films i didn't know that until just now what do you know yeah huh uh it's a it's a pretty bare bones release there is a 10 mm. minute special feature on there about uh jean-pierre whoever and uh, it's probably in French I can't I, it's too early to try to pull off French <laughs> that's all I got um, but uh, that's very French yeah yeah. Uh, it's about a 10 minute thing and it's probably on French so I wouldn't be able to understand any of it but yeah. huh this is now going on to my wish list <laughs> I was about to say I, like as just as just over the course of this discussion I've been like man I really need to get a region free Blu-ray player <laughs> like, oh man it'll change your life and your bank account uh, <laughs> oh, man. See, that's the part that I'm worried about. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's not as expensive. I don't know. Let's see. The Blu-ray is what? 17, 60 euros. I don't know what that translates to dollars right now, but yeah, it's out there. Hmm. It's, it's some blue. I, I well, must. someday when I invest in a region free Blu-ray player, then I will absolutely pick this up as the first one I get. Uh, as the first one, huh? Oh yeah. This, I, this movie's great. <laughs> It really is solid. Is there anything else you want to talk about with the movie before we kind of yeah, move on Yeah, there's here? just just one thing. There's okay. the writing in this. There's some really beautiful like mini monologues that I that I just kind of wanted to get some attention to because they are just absolutely wonderful. Okay. Um right at the beginning during Miracle's presentation, he gets like a guy says, you know, he's a heretic cuz he's teaching evolution. And Miracle says, heresy? Do they still burn men for heresy? Then burn me, monsieur. Light the fire. You think your little candle will outshine the flame of truth? Like, that's so, that's a, an amazing little mini monologue there. That's fantastic. That's really cool. And then later on, Pierre has a speech where he's talking about uh, Paris. Think of what all those walls are hiding. Broken hopes, bodies, hearts, absent dreams, starvation, madness, crimes of the streets and tragedies of the river. Paris, my city. Like, that's... That's phenomenal. It's very lyrical. It's very poetic and totally could have been done on stage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Totally. This, I think this whole thing really could have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, we talk about how groundbreaking, I guess, this is when it comes to the camera work. But really, this could be a stage production as well. I'd love to see a stage adaptation of this version of Murders in the Room work. It won't happen because it's not in public domain and universal and yeah. copyright law and blah, blah, blah. But, man, it would be great to see. Well, and I would be very curious to see what like lighting they would do on a stage production because like this is obviously in black and white, but the poster for Murders in the Room Org is almost neon. It has these greens and these yellows and these reds. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. The poster is amazing. And people who look at the cover art <laughs> for these episodes that we do here that they know that I like to try to take the movie poster and, you know, take out the title and put in monster kid radio and the font or the style. And mm. I've been looking at this one and I almost don't want to do that here because it's gorgeous. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> it really is that look on Lagosi's face. It, it I, ooh, amazing, amazing work. The way they lit it. It's very, very Basil Gorgos, very, just the way the lights are, are thrown across his face. It's very uh, magazine cover. I can totally see mm-hmm. that. It's gorgeous. Oh, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. I Ooh. Huh. That gives me an idea for something. Anyway, I'll note ooh. that and come back to it later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, you're talking about the writing. John Huston did some work on the script. <laughs> Really? Wow. <laughs> Uncredited. But yeah, he did some uh, work on some additional dialogue on the film. Uh, the I mean, that probably explains those monologues. Then. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are a handful of other writers accredited here, obviously Poe and Robert Flory. Uh, people that I don't know much about, Tom Reed and Dale Van Every and Ethel M. Kelly. Unfortunately, Ethel M. Kelly didn't get credit, probably because she's a woman and it's you know, yeah. the time. Uh, but I don't know much about these other folks as well. But yeah. I mean, it's a solid film. We've kind of spoiled it, but, you know, listeners, if you haven't seen this movie, I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. You can you can rent it on Amazon Prime. Do it. It's worth it. I was going to ask, you know, if it's on Prime, if it's streaming. Uh, well, it's it's I think it's like two ninety nine to rent or you can buy it, I think, for like ten. OK, but that's that's how I watched it as I just rented it. I rented it because I'm holding out hope that eventually they'll release a Blu-ray version of it <laughs> in the U.S. One that I can have like ready access to. Yeah, it is part of the uh, Universal Vault burn on delivery collection. You get it that way. The way that I first got it and added it to my collection was through the Bela Lugosi collection, which had. Uh, five movies in it. It was Murder in the Rue Morgue, The Black Cat, The Raven, The Invisible Ray, and Black Friday, all universal projects. And it was a good set, pretty bare bones, nothing really there you know, in it. There was like a trailer for Murders in the Rue Morgue, and that was about it. I think there might have been a Black Friday trailer too. But, you know, that collection sells for like 20 bucks. So I if bet. you, yeah, f five movies or six movies. Well, and it's worth it just for the black cat. That movie's great. Yeah, and why the black cat doesn't get better attention or more attention, I have no idea either. Yeah, you'd think it would. Especially at this point. I mean, they can't still be holding a, a grudge against Edgar Ulmer and, you know, his... Maybe they still are. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> they just got grandfathered in. <laughs> that was in the contract. Every time the Universal changed hands, it's like, and remember... <laughs> This guy. A list of bad guys. <laughs> this guy stays on the blacklist forever. <laughs> uh, but highly recommended. It gets the Monster Kid Radio Seal of Approval, the X Meets Y Seal of Approval. Mm -hmm. You got to see this film, guys. And gals. Absolutely. Everybody's got to see this movie. It's so good. Mm -hmm. So good. So I mentioned X Meets Y. How's that going for you? Oh, it is incredibly creatively fulfilling. I, I really love it. it it's, um, we just. Uh, put an episode up. Well, it's, it's going to be a while before we'll have more episodes between, but um, we just recently put an episode up as of this recording that I think is probably my favorite episode we've done so far. It is uh, Die Hard meets Clash of the Titans, and it was an absolute blast. Well. Oh, yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> uh, it's great. So for listeners who don't know X meets Y, they take two movies that are pretty different from each other, very disparate titles. And without much prep, the hosts bash the movies together and try to come up with one movie incorporating elements from the both. And it's fun. And like you said, it's a creative thing. It's because they're thinking off the top of their head. They're kind of flying by the seat. This man, I'm babbling now. I need more coffee. In one second. <laughs> That's okay. You're babbling about my podcast. So I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's a fun uh, conversation to listen to some very creative minds try to bash together a movie from these two different things that have nothing to do with each other. I'm curious about this Die Hard meets Clash of the Titans. That sounds... Uh, oh, it's great. Sounds it's fascinating. Fantastic. It's fascinating. Although your Cujo episode is still pretty up there for me. The <laughs> yes, that one That one is another one of my, my favorites as well. That one actually is with the same guest, with uh, Jay, my good friend, which whenever he's in town, he and I record at least one episode of X meets Y. Uh, in fact, the last time he was in town, we recorded the Die Hard meets Clash of the Titans. And then we also recorded one that has not released yet. That is Batman, specifically the 1966 Batman meets an American werewolf in London. Oh, sign me up. I want to see that movie. Right? I, I like want to make that movie. <laughs> like that's <laughs> wonderful. And that's the other thing I like about your show too, is that you do what I try to do is try to bring in a rotating you know, a stable of people. So it's not just the same mm -hmm. two voices every time. So you get the different points of views, which I enjoy as well. So thumbs up for you. You know, thumbs up, man. I dig it. Thank you. Thank you. What you're doing. Um, you've got, it's a lot of fun. You've got another appearance coming up on a different podcast. So a friend of the show, Jason Giaconetti, bots, bugs and babes. And I don't know when that's going to you know hit the pod waves as opposed to when this is actually going out. Cause we're recording about a month early here, but you're going to be on an episode of that talking about, Talking about 
the greatest movie from the 80s, as we previously teased, a little old film called Neon Maniacs. You know. I... I don't want to use the word outgrew, but every time I go through my DVD collection, I realize I've got a lot of movies there that I just don't watch anymore. Movies sure. that I've picked up over the years, the Friday the 13th films, Sight Rain Elm Street, you know, the stuff from the 80s that I just, mm-hmm. you know, just not really interested in anymore. You know, I, sure. I, I've used them and I've kind of moved on. But Neon Maniacs, I have on Blu-ray, and I think it's one that's just, I can't, I can't erase, man. No, it's, it's so aggressively weird. Like it's, it's very satisfying to like, one of my things that I do is I have a couple friends that I watch like bad movies with, or, or just weird movies with. So I've been trying to show neon maniacs to every single one of my friends. Um, and my wife, she gets a little mad because she's seen it already. I think three times now. And she's like, I don't, I don't need to see more of this movie. By all rights, it shouldn't be (laughs) something that makes me, I don't know that this draws me in, but you know, it is what it is. (laughs) Yeah, it's just it's aggressively bizarre and it it makes it really a really fun watch. The more you watch it, the the more interesting it gets and the more invested you get in all the weirdness. <laughs> so, yeah, go check out Bots, Bugs and Babes for that. <laughs> I'm not yes, going to spend absolutely. yeah, I could get lost. And it's a great show. I've been listening to a lot of it in in prep for um when we uh do record it. So, I it's a great show. Yeah, Jason's Everybody a good guy. To it. Jason's a good guy. So, Mm-hmm. Right on. Anything else coming up for you? Any other podcasts or any other creative projects that listeners should know about? Well, kind of. It's it's something that is, I, I don't know how far off it is yet, but I'm putting the finishing touches on a kaiju novel Okay. Um, called Gods of Disaster. Good title. Um, I'm, good title. I, I went through a bunch of different titles to get to that one. Uh, it has been a good experience. It's my first like long form book length um, thing. I, I usually don't write in prose. I usually write scripts. So... I'm, I'm very excited about it. I'm putting the finishing touches on it. And now I'm just kind of looking into if I'm going to self publish or try and find like some small publishing house that's willing to put it out. So if any listeners out there have ideas for a publishing house that would want to take a kaiju novel, please let me know because I'm trying to figure out what to do with this thing now that it's almost done. Well, I wish you the best of luck there. Uh, listeners know that I have been writing some things, and we've had a number of writers on the show in the past. Uh, so I, I wish you the absolute best. Please keep me posted about what's going on with that. If you do sell it, if you do self-publish, of course, we want to help promote it here on Thank MKR. You, you know, we, we like to support our own, and especially a kaiju novel. Sign me up, man. It's a good old-fashioned two kaiju fighting type deal. So, you know, good kaiju, bad kaiju. It's a good time. Right on. Right on. I'm I'm all I'm all in. I'm all in. And I didn't even tell you any of the details. <laughs> yep. <laughs> hey, you know, how hard is it to come up? I mean, I don't know. I man, that sounded kind of negative. That wasn't meant to be. Oh, how, no, not at all. How that's, hard that's is like it for the fun of kaiju stuff? Yeah, really. I mean, it's 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 not a hard sell for somebody like mm-hmm. me. Is what I'm saying. I feel you. I, I will consume any kaiju stuff that comes out. So you tell pub- you tell publishers that, and you know, Derek likes it. So. Yeah, <laughs> I but, have I have exactly one person who will buy it. <laughs> we could probably come up with three or four more. I'm just saying. Yeah, I could probably find somebody. You know, and especially with the new Godzilla movie coming up, which, by the way, oh man, that trailer. The trailer. Oh, it's my favorite part of the trailer is Rodan. Uh, obviously, I'm a huge Rodan fan, and mm-hmm. to have the shadow of Rodan passing over a city and in the wake, you oh, see. It's the, the, so good. But what I do love is that somebody went and took that trailer and recut it. To make it look like a Showa era Godzilla movie trailer. Really? I'll I'll find it and I'll send it to you. Oh wow. Um, it, That's awesome. It, it turned up on I Facebook. Have to see that. It looks amazing. It, that's great. <laughs> that's so cool. Sign me up. Man, I'm so excited for that movie. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a good time. Um mm-hmm. I don't normally have this happen to me when I'm watching something on the small screen, but when I'm watching the trailer and Ghidorah shows up, goosebumps and chills, man. Oh, oh yes. boy. For me, it was as soon as the like Mothra wings folded out, like I was like, like all of a sudden I was like, oh, I did not expect to get really emotional watching this trailer. Right. Right. Wow. Oh, amazing. Oh, man. So thank you for listening to this episode about Murders in the Room Morgue. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) We'll be back with the Godzilla podcast. Yeah, we'll come back to, (laughs) yeah. Uh, You know, this has happened. So when a couple of monster kids start talking, this is what happened. So. Because I want to save myself a bunch of editing, I think I'll probably go ahead and wrap 
up because we yes, can go obviously. on about kaiju films and neon maniacs and who knows what else will come up in the conversation. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being involved with Monster Kid Radio, and I wish you the best of luck with the novel, your podcast, anything else you got coming up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we've become friends and uh, can't wait to have you on the show again in the future. Thank you so much. I, I've really, really enjoyed being on your show this time and this last time. Like it's and it's good that we had like polar opposite movies because it, it very much <laughs> like we could, we, you know, we kind of ran the gamut of what kinds of discussions we were having, which is great. Are you saying Murders in the Room Morgue and Santo versus a Blob would make a terrible double feature? What I am saying is they would make a wonderful X meets Y episode. Oh, there you go. <laughs> We're probably not going to do it because it'd be very hard, but <laughs> it would be great if we could. The X Meets Y podcast is where you're going to find Jonathan in body on a regular basis. Head over to xmeetsy.libson.com. Again, link in the show notes. Check it out. Let them know that you heard him here on Monster Kid Radio. Let them know what you think of the show. I think it's a lot of fun. Jonathan's a creative guy, and so much so that he's still working on the kaiju novel. But I asked him, actually today, as of this recording, what the status is of the novel since that recording took place like over a month ago. Because I wanted to let you guys and gals know, and he's actually working on a short film now, too. So on top of everything else he's got a short film in the work so best of luck to you jonathan thank you for being part of the show thanks for your patience as we were working on getting you into the show into the mix for this year's edgar august poe month and if, and if we do edgar august poe again next year listeners i'll do my best to make sure that the episodes actually come out in august thanks again jonathan <laughs> Welcome to an evening with Karloff, the master of menace in five fright-filled features. Watch breathlessly as the coffin opens to release the terror duck. <laughs> it's only a gal and bulls, the raven. Join Boris Karloff. In the most gruesome day of the undead, Black Sabbath. And there are two more blood-chilling delights. Die, monster, die. And who knows? You may die. Laughing at the comedy of terrors. Five of Carlos' creepiest capers in nightmare colors. And you are invited. How do you do? We're about to unfold the story of Frankenstein. This is Tom Lang. And this is Bill Evenson. And we're the hosts of a new podcast called Frankenstein Minute. That's right. We've taken the classic Universal Studios Frankenstein films and broken them down minute by minute. And each episode, we're going to dissect one minute of Frankenstein. We'll talk about Colin Clive, who played Henry Frankenstein. Dwight Fry, his hunchback assistant. Mae Clark, Henry's fiance. And of course, don't forget that monster, played by the enigmatic question mark. We'll also talk about the director, James Whale, and the fascinating flourishes he brought to the picture. And Mrs. Percy B. Shelley, Mary, of course, the author of the original novel on which the film was based. And the difference between the novel and the film. This really is a classic film, the one that many point to as the one that started it all. Um, Dracula? Uh, sure. But, you know, seriously, one minute a week? How long is Frankenstein? Frankenstein is 71 minutes. Are you sure we can uh, keep this going for 71 weeks? Oh, sure, no problem. I mean, this is Frankenstein we're talking about, not Dracula. Good point. We'll discuss characters' motivations and talk about the great performances and John Bowles. <laughs> Don't forget, Kenneth Strickfadden and his amazing electrical devices. We'll even reveal which of the lead actors grew up in sleepy little Chaska, Minnesota. Frankenstein Minute premieres on August 31st, 2018. Where? You know, the usual places, iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. And check us out on FrankensteinMinute.com and Facebook and Twitter, if that's still a thing. Is Twitter still alive? Oh, it's alive. It's alive? It's alive. They live by night. They hide in the dark and rise from the shadows. They can never feel the warmth of living human blood in their veins. Their bodies are cold and dead. Dracula, 
versus Frankenstein. who serves the dead. A dead man who controls the doctor and a living creature horribly created from the mangled corpses of their victims. Dracula versus Frankenstein. His blood is cold, but his mind is keen. He cannot die, for he is already dead. His name is Dracula. Another lives, but his body belongs to the dead. The two will join forces, but only one will survive. Dracula versus Frankenstein. Oakmoor Cemetery is a cold, lifeless place to visit at night. Unless you're already dead, and your name is Dracula. Together, in one film, they meet in a fight of fright. The kings of horror battle to the death. Dracula versus Frankenstein. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. I want to thank you for sticking around to the end of the show because I wanted to give a special shout out to friend of the show, Jason Giaconetti from the Bots, Bugs, and Babes podcast. You heard the promo for his show earlier in this episode. I want to give him a shout out because he's dealing with some health stuff. He mentioned on Facebook that he's got some pretty uh, crazy making health things happening right now. I know it would drive me crazy. And I just want to let him know that Monster Kid Radio's got his back. Also, I want to let the Monster Kid Radio listeners know that my wife, Brenda, appreciates you having our back. We mentioned in the last week's episode that her grandmother did pass on, and we're dealing with that. Now, her family's all up in Alaska, so we are actually going to be flying her up to Alaska for the services next week. Things have been a little crazy around here, dealing with my surgery, and then this happening, and everything else going on in our world. So, just big thanks to you guys and gals for having my wife's back on all of this. And she said to say hello. She loves y'all. And she'll be back on the show probably in a couple of weeks at this point. Which means any feedback that you've sent in, I'm going to sit on until I have her back on the show because it doesn't feel right to do feedback without my wife. If you have any feedback for the show and you want to make sure that my wife reads your email on the air, well, just drop me an email at monsterkidradio at gmail.com. Or you can call us and leave us a voicemail. At 503-479-5657. That's 503-479-5MKR. That's the same phone line that Jeff Polier uses when he calls in with a weird Wednesday report from the Joy Cinema here in the Portland, Oregon area. I'm hoping to have him back in the mix next week as well. It's been a crazy few weeks for um, a lot of monster kids. You know, Jason, me, everybody else. Just It's been nuts. So... Hoping things kind of even out within the next couple of weeks here on Monster Kid Radio. Speaking of the next couple of weeks on Monster Kid Radio, I want to give you a sneak peek, a preview, a heads up, spoiler perhaps, of what's happening over the next few weeks of Monster Kid Radio. Well, after Monster Bash, I went nuts and tried to get as many recordings as I could in the virtual can because I wanted to build up because I knew Edgar August Poe month was coming up and I knew I had my surgery and everything else going on. And I'm sitting on some awesome recordings. If I didn't record anything for the next month and a half, I'd be okay because I've got recordings with Chris McMillan about the monster Piedras Blancas. I have a recording with Tracy Morris about the movie The Wasp Woman. I have a recording with Alan Trump about the movie Hand of Night. And I have a recording with Dan Day Jr. about his experiences on the new Joshua Kennedy film, House of the Gorgon, which is in post-production right now. And I'm working on the sound effects. It's been awesome. I can't wait until it's done so everybody can check it out. It's going to be great. Anyway, I'm sitting on all these recordings as well as a few others. 
that you can expect over the next few weeks. The Dan Day recording probably going to hold off on until the House of the Gorgon comes closer to being released. But let's say next week, why don't we have Tracy Morris on the show to talk about the Wasp Woman? <laughs> Supposing a more powerful form of royal jelly could be obtained. From the queen wasp, for example. Socially, the queen wasp is on level with a black widow spider. Oh, no, 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 no. There might be danger. Those are my terms, Mr. Fincher. Janice Starlin will be the next guinea. A woman of fantastic desires. Sponsoring a scientist with fantastic theories and demanding fantastic results. How old do I look? Tell me! How old? 23. The enzymes. The enzymes, they're, they're going crazy. Miss Darling will kill her and tear her body to shreds. And then the week after that, Stephen D. Sullivan is returning to Monster Kid Radio because he and I are finally going to go over the results of this year's Monster Rally Retro Awards, or the rallies. For those of you who don't know, every year we award the best actor, actress, director, monster, and just best film of genre cinema of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. It's opened up to you guys and gals. It's it's all voted on by the Monster Kid Radio community. And this year we're going to be honoring the best in 1934, 44, and 54. The ballot's been closed for about a month now. But I have the results, and Steve and I are going to review those and announce the winners in two weeks. So you know you're going to want to come back. For that. And finally, before I stop holding your ears monster hostage, I want to let everybody know, this may be a reminder for some of you, those of you who follow me on Facebook, but those of you who don't know, in October, on Halloween Day, we're doing a virtual Monster Kid Radio crash through Rabbit TV. Head over to Rabbit TV and set up an account now and... Oh boy, this is going to be awesome. Rabbit TV can be found at R-A-B-B dot I. It's free to set up an account. And once you set up the account, look for Monster Kid Radio, all one word, capital M, capital K, capital R, and send me a friend request. Because on Halloween Day, I'm going to be doing nothing but streaming monster movies. And the reason this is cool is because there's going to be a live chat that you can participate in on Halloween. If you can only make it for one or two movies, that's fine. If you want to be around for the entire ride, that's fine too. I'm going to be here. We're going to have monster movies. We're going to have some special features. It's going to be a blast. So Rabbit TV, get yourself set up now. Get familiar with the website because on Halloween in about a month and a half now, I guess, or maybe a little bit longer than that, way too long, we're having a virtual crash and you're invited. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song, The Los Deformes Stomp. It is from the band Los Deformes, which you can find over at losdeformes.bandcamp.com. The album is called Unos Vocaciones Estereo Galacticus. I think I got it right. Anyway, follow the link in the show notes and pick up the album four tracks for four euros. It's a steal. Check them out and let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek M. Cook. Talk to everybody next week when we talk about The Wasp Woman with Tracy Morris. Ciao.